Hi folks, it's Andy and welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Uh, a little bit late this week, but better late than never. Um, I've got plenty of uh, <laughs> questions for you uh, this week. Um, some really, really great ones actually. Really looking forward to jumping into them. Uh, but before I do, uh, don't forget if these videos um, or this channel brings you any value whatsoever, if it is something that you enjoy and you'd like to see more of, don't forget you can support us by doing your shopping at Kendo Star. Com. Kendo Star uh, is my website that provides fantastic, wonderful, amazing, brilliant, stupendous, awesome, and all the other good words, uh, <laughs> Kendo equipment all around the world. And um, if you don't believe me how great it is, you can check out our reviews because we are by far the best re reviewed uh, Kendo website uh, online. So get to kendostar.com. Okay, um, <clears throat> next, uh, let's get into these questions. So uh, the first one says, uh, this one came to me actually by private message and it's accompanied by a diagram, which I'll put up on the screen in a minute. Um, it says, I do train alone for the last seven years and I'm struggling pr to prepare for fourth dan. Uh, I've no clue on how to approach a uh, Shinsa or Shiai with the right mindset. Uh, and my situation does not allow me to accumulate enough keiko time to learn this naturally, so I have to overthink it. The picture presents a flowchart on how do I picture the mind process to do a nice keiko. Does it make sense? Is it crazy? Or would you change something? So the picture is uh, here. Okay, so uh, look. The picture for me is just, it's far too confusing. Uh, <laughs> um, you're definitely overthinking it, okay? Um, you don't need to think about it on that sort of critical level. Um, I'm sure it's accurate, all right? Like I've tried to sort of look at it and kind of follow the arrows around uh, and I'm, sh I'm sure it's accurate and I'm sure it's correct. Um, but you don't you don't have time to go through that thought process when you're in a, a situation where somebody is attacking you with the shinai. Okay, so look, if you're going for fourth dan, all right? You need to have met all the criteria for third dan, all right? Uh, that needs to be present in your kendo. That means you need to be able to make strikes with kikentai no ichi that meet the uh, criteria of yuko datotu. Also, what we're starting to look at now for fourth dan is you need to be able to um, you need to be able to show that there's intention or purpose behind the um, the actions that you're taking, all right? So. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you always have to make the right decision or the right choice. Um, but what it does mean is that you have to, there has to be some sort of rationale, uh, the eye, uh, it's called in Japanese, um, behind uh, the waza that you choose or um, the way that you interact with your opponent. All right. So all that just means, put simply, right, is that you don't just act independently on your own. All right. Oh, I want to attack Kote. Kote, I want to attack men, men, okay? You choose your waza and the way that you act based on how your opponent reacts to your interaction with them or their, or your semi, okay? Um, and yes, the diagram that you put up, uh, that you sent, sorry, um, does give some good examples of how you can make that, um, that selection. Um, but don't worry too much if you make the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> um, try to make the right one, of course. But the important thing is, is that you're trying trying to have the eye or rationale to the actions that you take, okay? That's the best advice I, g I can give, I think. Okay, next one. Um, how much does the quality of Shinai matter? Are there certain markers to look for on particular qualities? So um, in terms of the quality of Shinai, um, the different things... Um, Look, you can get really cheap rubbish shinai, all right? Not from Kendo Star, um, but you can probably still get, you used to be able to get, I haven't seen them for a while, to be honest, but then I don't really look at um, other Kendo websites other than Kendo Star, but um, the, you used to be able to get like really cheap rubbish shinai um, where the, the bamboo hadn't, it probably hadn't been like treated properly and stuff, dried out properly and stuff. They used to break really quickly. But after you get to a certain point, once you get to a sort of uh, standard price for basic shinai, right up to quite expensive shinai, the process of the bamboo itself, how they treat the bamboo, how they look after the bamboo, doesn't change massively. I know there's like smoked ones and stuff, uh, and there's different types of bamboo. Um, but 
in terms of uh, durability, there's not a massive difference, all right? So there's not a massive difference between uh, the entry-level Shinai, something like the Goriki or um, the, uh, like the, the all-purpose Kendo Star Shinai in terms of durability with some of the more expensive models, even in the, like, the Kin Judashi range, in terms of durability of the bamboo itself. However, there's other things that affect durability, all right? Things like the type of Shinai. A Kotogata Shinai, um, or an all-purpose type Shinai will always be more durable than a Jisengata type Shinai or a Dobari Shinai, right? Because of the way that they're shaved, right? The way that they're shaped. Um, what you're getting when you pay for sort of uh, a, a higher quality Shinai, like when you get into like the Kin Judishi series that we offer on Kendo Star, for example, is more care has been taken over um, the actual construction of the Shinai, the actual shaving of the bamboo, um, even of even though the the you know the 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 bamboo is either madake or keichiku, they're the two main types of bamboo. Um, the actual care that's been taken to you know put the shinai together and to make it a really beautifully balanced, nice feeling shinai is what what tends to change. Okay, so if you're just starting out in Kendall, it's not worth going and spending a lot of money on like a premium series shinai um, because you haven't quite got used to what you like and what you don't like about the sort of nuances of different shinai. Um, so in terms of, uh, of the difference, it's more the feel that they give rather than like the, the durability, okay? So don't think that buying a more expensive shinai equals a more durable shinai. Um, so it's not necessarily the case. As you become more uh, accomplished in kendo, more advanced in kendo, uh, it's recommended that you have different shinai for different purposes. Um, I don't use the same shinai all the time, all right? I don't use jisengata shinai for kirikaishi and uchikomi because it's called a jisengata shinai because it's for the real match, all right? So I only use them in like the jigeko or in the shiai or that sort of situation. Um, I don't use them for like kirikaishi and stuff like that. They're not designed for that. Uh, and they're not durable enough for that. Um, so, you know, it, you have to think about what situation you're using the Shinai for. And that's that's definitely something else you need to consider. Um, in terms of different markers to look for in particular qualities, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult uh, because, no, there isn't a massive sort of thing um, that says, you know, you can just look at it. I mean, you can tell if you know what you're looking at, you can tell when a Shinai has been put together nicely to compared to like a really cheap NAF one. Um, but I don't come into contact with that sort of cheap rubbish shinais these days. Um, Cause like, like I say at Kendo Star, we don't touch anything like that. So, uh, so yeah. Um, just one last point on the shinai though, even between Keichiku and Madake. Keichiku is a um, Taiwanese species of bamboo and Madake is a Japanese species of bamboo. It's not where it's grown, it's the, the original native species. All right, so lots of Madake Shinai, um, the Shinai is still grown like in China or something. It doesn't mean it's grown in Japan. Um, and that is in itself actually affects the, the, the sort of consistency of the bamboo itself. Um, it was thought in the past that Madake was more durable than Keichiku by virtue of the fact that it was more expensive. And um, it's actually become a lot cheaper now as Madake, um, largely because because they started to grow it more in China uh, for the use of, uh, for Shinai. Um, originally, they didn't bother growing it in China very much because um, it's not something that was cultivated there because the uh, the root, the takenoko, uh, you eat it, right? They eat the bamboo shoot, that's it. Um, and the madake one is apparently quite, um, what do you say, like bitter compared to the keichiku one. So it, was, it wasn't widely popular in China originally. Um, but anyway, uh, because of Shinai production, Madake is largely grown over there. Um, so the, the price is kind of leveled out. The main difference between Madake and Keichiku is more to do with the feel um, of the, uh, the Shinai rather than um, the durability. Having said that, Madake tends to flake um, and splinter rather than just make a, a clean break. Doesn't mean it never does it, it just tends to, okay? Um, so I guess it depends on your style of kendo, but 
potentially you might get more use out of madake if um you know if you find that it breaks right like in a kind of if it splinters before breaking you could kind of shave it to get a little bit more life out of it some people find that okay uh next one uh will kendo star be looking to introduce the men's shields and men masks should it become the case that most international fe federations will follow the current ajkf approach uh post lockdown uh, to post lockdown keiko and when the situation allows for it so what you're talking about is like the the men mask is a uh, like a, a cloth mask made from a tenugiri fold, folded in half and then attached tied around your face with string actually comes into contact with your face um and then the um the shield is like a plastic shield that goes on the inside of the mengane <clears throat> there's a couple of different styles there's one that just does the bottom half of your face uh one that just does your eyes they sometimes can be used together um and then there's i, I believe there's ones that are like a one piece full face one I've talked about the shields um, in another video, uh, which I only put up yesterday. Um, I'll link it in the uh, <clears throat> in the description below. Um, we will probably sell the shields because it might be uh, the case that uh, they are required by uh, Kendo federations around the world in order to restart Kendo. I've seen one and I've tried one now, and I don't think it will be a massive impact in terms of um how it will affect people's uh practice it's far enough away from your mouth to still allow for kind of breathing it didn't i didn't feel that it was much of a hindrance to my breathing on the same note i do not think that they are effective at mitigating the spread of viruses um certainly not on their own um so do not buy them for that purpose <laughs> uh the, the, the All Japan Federation, Kendo Federation has said uh, by putting the cotton uh, mask, um, the men mask on first and then using the shields, uh, that helps with the spraying out of droplets of uh, saliva. Uh, but again, that's not necessarily proven to mitigate uh, virus contamination. But look, if it's something that is uh, starting to be compulsory so that we can get back to the dojo, then of course I'll support that and I'll, I'll offer those uh, as and when um, I see fit. Uh, next one. Um, <clears throat> this came up in a conversation with a, friends, uh, with a friend. Are the terms yokomen and sayumen uh, practically the same these days? Uh, I thought yokomen was typically used to refer to the one-handed strike uh, that comes, uh, to, uh, comes a flat, uh, like flatter in approach. Uh, than what you see in Kirikaishi, uh, kind of the helicopter one-handed old stuff that's largely disappeared. Okay, so uh, from a point of view of terminology, um, the, the the terms yokomen and sayumen are generally interchangeable. Yokomen literally just means side men, so it's used to refer to both sides. Um, so sayumen, sa is... Uh, uh sa is uh left <laughs> and uh you is uh right okay so that's what the sayu means left and right men um i had to think there about the kanji <laughs> uh but basically sayu means left and right men all right so effectively they're saying the same thing one saying side men and the other saying left and right men but let's say if you were to put it in the context of okay i'm going to make a strike to uh here you wouldn't call a strike to here a strike to the sayu men it should be called the uh, yoko men um or uh the migi men okay because the right men yes yeah, my right yeah um so that's the slight difference in nuance, I guess. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it literally just means side was sideways men or uh, sayu is left and right men. So the, effectively they're interchangeable. You've got to remember these are, these are linguistic terms. They're not hard and fast te terminology. They're not set in stone, all right? Um, it, it's like uh, we've got another similar question later I've seen as well. Um, in fact, it's the next one um, about the, the, the usage of the word uh, chi sai men. We'll talk about it in a second. But um, 
Like in English, for example, we could say big or we could say large. They both effectively mean the same thing. Um, and it's it's sort of the same. All right. It, it's not a strict terminology. It's language. It's fluid. Uh, and it, it depends on the person speaking. OK. Um, next one. Um, so I just mentioned this. It says uh, I've heard both the terms chi sai men and sashi men used to refer to small men cuts in the UK. Do these words broadly mean the same thing, a bit like debana versus degashira, um, or are they different waza? So this is an interesting one because it's a little bit different to what we just talked about, all right? Chi sai men, chi sai means small, okay? Um, I hardly used, heard either of these terms used in Japan, hardly ever, okay? Um, if either would be said, it would be chi sai rather than sashi. But I have heard people say sashi men. Sometimes when I've heard people talk about sashi men, it's been in a different context. So chi sai means small. Sashi men comes from sasu, it means to stab. Okay. So the the nuance between chi sai men means to make a small men strike, whereas Sashi men, the, the, the nuance is like you're making a kind of stabbing men, like you're stabbing at the men rather than a hit this way. It's like a stabbing at the men this way, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, and I have heard it used in that context. And I've heard people say in Japan, different sensei say it's wrong to do sashi men because it's not actually striking. Uh, and I've heard other sensei say, oh, do the sashi men because it's faster. OK, so. It's a bit, you know, <laughs> um, again, up for interpretation. I wouldn't use the term sashimen to describe small men attacks because I think there's ambiguity there that's too, that's, it, that's up for interpretation uh, in the Japanese language. Um, if you went to a random kendo club uh, in Japan and said sashimen, there's a chance they might say, yeah, we know what you're so talking about. And there's another chance where people would be like, what does that mean? If you said chi sai men, everyone would understand what you're talking about. Okay. So uh, for me, um, I would use the word chi sai men. But again, it's not a term. Just, it, it, I mean, it's not a term really that um, I've heard used much. I don't use either of those terms. If I'm teaching in English, I say small men. If I'm teaching in Japanese, I just say men. And if they do the big men, I'd say chisaku, it just means to do smaller. Okay. Well, I might, I guess I might say chisai men. I guess, maybe. Depends on the context. I don't think I'd ever say sashi men. Uh, okay. Uh, next one. How is kendo perceived by ordinary Japanese people in daily life? Uh, is it like the West where someone's a football player, they don't really care uh, and treat like any other sports, it would find it respectable to some degree. So um, I guess if you talk to somebody in Japan, a normal person, regular person um, that doesn't do kendo, um, about kendo, I, yeah, I guess they have the impression of you being a little bit more kind of, um, because it's budo, I guess they have the impression of you being kind of um, a bit straight laced. Uh, a bit majime, they would say in Japanese, like kind of serious. Um, I guess there might be that impression. Um, I don't think they'd have the press, the sort of impression of you being like a kind of sports jock type person, um, which I think is the sort of impression people have of uh, some other sports. Um, but I don't know. That sort of thing tends to be like, a, I think... A, that sort of attribution is more more towards sort of high school students. And I wasn't a high school student in Japan. Um, further, my experience was obviously different again from other people. Um, like if I'm sure if a normal Japanese person said to another Japanese person, oh, I do kendo light, by the way, they'd be like probably a little bit similar to how uh, you you and I react when maybe someone says they do football or tennis or something. Like, oh, right. Okay, cool. That's interesting. But it, when I said it, because I'm a, because I'm not Japanese and I was foreign and I was in Japan learning a Japanese art, then they take a different approach. They'd be like, Kendall, you do Kendall. Wow. Okay. That's why kind of thing. Do they even have Kendall abroad? Like that sort of conversation happens. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the way that would go. 
Uh, next one. Hi, Andy. In Japanese dojos, is the shomen, shomen particularly reflected in the teaching? Uh, I mean, is the meaning of the shomen a part of the dojo's identity? And how do does one do? Uh, sorry. And how do one dojo come up with the shomen? So it really varies from dojo to dojo. Um, if it's a dojo that is only used as a dojo, uh, only used as a ken dojo, then usually there is like um like a. a what do you call it? A kamiza, like a it's like a little shrine <laughs> thing, um, that's placed in the sort of highest seat of the dojo. It's like the um, what do you call it? It's a kamidana. Sorry, not kamiza. Kamidana, uh, which goes like um, yeah, it's like a little uh little shrine thing, wooden shrine thing, and they put like the like sake and stuff in. I've never really had much to do with it, to be honest, but um. The dojos I practiced in often didn't have them, but uh, it would usually be placed like in the on the wall furthest from the door, the entrance, um, which is is generally in Japanese culture that's considered the highest respected place. Like if you went to a went out for a meal with like people from your work, for example, nothing to do with kendo, then um, the the highest ranking person that or the oldest person, the highest person in the hierarchy that exists in Japanese social structure would sit at the, f uh, the furthest chair away from the entrance. Like they would sit in the, in the back. Um, that's, that's normal. If you sort of went in there as a new person and just went and sat in the sort of back, like the, you know, furthest away from the entrance, you'd be probably considered a little bit, um, ignorant. So, um, yeah, the, the, the main thing is, is, uh, that ha they tend to have those in most um, most uh, dojos that are specifically used for dojos. Um, many other dojos don't use that sort of facility. Like one of the dojos that I used to teach at for the kids, that that dojo was a as a primary school gymnasium. Um, and the gymnasium doubles as an assembly hall, so there's a stage in there as well. And in every school in Japan, to my knowledge, above the stage is the Japanese flag. Um, so that would be treated in the same way as um, as the shomen or the, the kamidana would be. Um, and yeah, I guess um, it's not something that like, it's not something that's spoken about a lot though. Of course, during the, the deigi, deiho, at the start of the class, they either do in the... Um, uh again it depends on the dojo in the in the sports hall where it was just the flag they would just say shomen ni day um and in the uh dojos that i've been in i've heard them say shinzen ni day which was like towards the the kamidana uh, and actually another dojo that i used to be a member of um the dojo itself was inside the grounds of a temple they had quite an elaborate kamidana in there with a with a statue of the buddha in there and um they used to say gobutsu dan ni dei so that was like uh do the bow towards the the buddha <laughs> um so that was kind of uh, different um so yeah uh so yeah I, I guess that had quite a big meaning of part of that dojo's identity uh, especially the dojo itself was named after the the, te the the sort of temple that it was in the grounds of. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't think it's particularly reflected in the teaching, though. Nobody is like, oh, you know, t talking about the kamidana or the shomen when they're, uh, uh, you know, teaching stuff. Uh, next one. Um, hi, Andy. Uh, are all the kendo kata taken from ittoryu or are there some based on kata from other koryu? uh and which ones so i don't know much about koryu um frankly uh, i only know about modern kendo uh, and i'm not that hot on the history of modern kendo <laughs> i know a bit about it but certainly not about the kata i do know though uh that uh, basically it was i think it was like in the early 1900s that the first kata came about and there was only three um the heaven the earth and the human um which is like Jordan, Chudan, Gedan, which I guess is the basis of the first three kata. Um, so originally there was just the first three kata, uh, which is why number three is like the hardest one. Um, 
and then they added more later, I think. Um, and when they added more, uh, there was like a group of teachers from all around, Kenja teachers from all around Japan. And they were from all different styles. I think every style was able, or every prefecture was able to send one representative or possibly two. Um, and they were from all over. Uh, and Ittoryu itself is not one style. There's lots of styles of Koryu called Ittoryu. There's like uh, uh, Onoha Ittoryu. There's uh, Mizoguchi Ha Ittoryu. Uh, what's the other one? Hokushin Ittoryu. I think Hokushin Ittoryu was a big influence on Kendo, actually. Um, I couldn't tell you which kata were taken from which styles. Um, I don't know. And I don't even know if that's recorded anywhere. Um, but I, I'm sure there's, there's, you know, there's like Jikishin Kageru's on there and stuff. They're, they're all, there's all different Yuha that are, um, that were represented in the, uh, what do you call it? The group of people that, um, the committee uh, that made the, the current Nihon Kendo Kata. So it's, 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 influenced from uh from lots of different styles uh hi andy i was looking at some of your older instruction videos and i noticed you have a very loose right hand grip during kamae uh, and you posted a picture i saw uh what's the reason that you do it this way so what you're talking about i've got shinai here is uh it's not even on camera but when i hold the shinai one of the nuances of my kamae it's my personal style is i tend to hold the um the right hand very very loosely Okay, not not like this, but very 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 loosely, um, and uh, the, I try to at the moment of, of striking, squeeze with the right hand then uh, for tenuji. Uh, but it's just I guess it's just my own uh, way of making sure I'm not gripping too much with the right hand. Okay, but you mustn't mustn't like hold it like this. That's not correct. But um, I I tend to keep um, a, a very loose grip of my right hand. Um, probably shouldn't really, but it's a, it's a bit of a, a nuance of my own kamae. It's not something I do particularly, um, intentionally, uh, or on purpose. Um, so I wouldn't advise copying it necessarily either. <laughs> um, next one, uh, when the first shinsa after quarantine rolls around, do you think more students will, uh, fail because they're out of practice or more will pass because the senseis know why they're out of practice or no change? So, uh, look, First off, about the senseis judging the shinsa, they should not lower their standards based on the fact that people have been in quarantine and not been able to practice. That would demean the um, uh, the whole process of the, the dan grading system um, because that would mean it's easier to pass third dan, let's say, uh, this year than it will be next year or it was last year. That's not correct and that should not happen. Um, they should be, especially as the criteria of uh, grading are pretty objective. Um, so uh, that should not happen. The Shinsai, the people doing the Shinsai should not be sat there thinking, well, they've been in quarantine, they've been out, probably out of practice. So um, let's, uh, let's be a bit lenient. Uh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't expect that to happen. Um, whether that means that people will pass or fail more, I don't know because I don't, I very much doubt that it's going to be the case that let's say, okay, uh, next week, next week, um, practice can resume. Uh, and then the week after there's going to be a Shinsa. I very much doubt that's going to happen for the most part. I very much doubt it. Um, secondly, um, I don't think this might be controversial, I don't think the lockdown is a good excuse for you not being able to uh, pass your shinsa. Um, I don't think, uh, if if I knew I had a shinsa coming in three months and from today, and I still, and I knew that, I knew that three months ago when the lockdown started, I had a shinsa in six months and we were going into lockdown. I didn't know when it was gonna end. I'd still be training throughout the lockdown, even though if it was on my own, doing Saburi and concentrating on my own Kendo. Of course, that doesn't make up for practicing with a partner, but um, I don't think that your uh, ability will have dropped so significantly over that time if you've been putting effort and concentration into it um, in order for you to fail uh, the Shinsa. Probably if you were to fail the Shinsa after the lockdown, it's probably because you probably wouldn't have passed it before. 
Um, so my um, feeling is, is that there will be no real change in the um, kind of, uh, what do you say, the, the, the percentage of people passing and failing gradings. Uh, hello, why does the Mune design uh, have this kind of greyish colour? Does it hold a cultural meaning or is it due to the material used? So the Mune, it's not grey, it's black, but it's got a kind of gloss finish usually because it's made of a what's called Kurozan leather. It's like a kind of uh, lacquered um, gloss finish leather. And then it's stitched um, usually with like a dot stitch that breaks it up a little bit. So that's why it looks that kind of greyish colour, but it's not grey, it's, it's actually black. Um, and it's just a little bit reflective. It's not massively um, like a cultural uh, meaning, certainly not the colour. They use that Kurozan leather because it's durable um, and they have done in the past. It used to be made, um, originally, it used to be made by using Urushi lacquer to uh, actually um, lacquer the, the leather in the first place. That's hardly ever done anymore because it's extremely expensive and there aren't, aren't many craftsmen that do it. So usually it's it, it, it's still real leather, but it's a, a synthetic process. It's not Urushi that's that's used to lacquer it now. Um, but yeah, back in the day, that's what they would have done in the past. Um, so yeah, um, I wouldn't say it's particularly uh, culturally um, relevant. Uh, next one, why are Shinai and Bokken uh, different sizes uh, and how does the kata tie into shi Shinai Kendo? Uh, so the Bokken and Bokto are different sizes because the, bok the Bokken or Bokto is used in the kata as a direct representation of a katana or a Japanese sword. The Shinai is not supposed to be a direct replacement or uh, representation of a Japanese sword uh, and that's why they're different lengths. The different lengths... Uh, but the length of the Shinai is as it is uh, because uh, in the past there wasn't any sort of regulations on the length of it. And then obviously as competition Kendall became a thing, people were starting to use very long ones. So they set a length for them. Um, so yeah, the Shinai shouldn't be thought of as a replacement of a Japanese sword. Uh, in terms of how the kata ties into Shinai Kendo, uh, it ties into it in lots of ways, um, but probably not massively relevantly until after you get at least fifth dan, um, in which you start to learn things about datotsu no kikai, uh, seme, uh, semei, uh, and these sort of things. Um, so things like the opportunities for striking or the relationship between the di as well, the rationale between waza, uh, and yourself and your opponent. Um, I think that's how they mostly tie into it. Okay, next one. Uh, a lot of dojos will start their activity again after weeks or months off. Out of all the dojos that you know, can you please tell us whether or not they'll get back to their usual way of conducting a practice or is there some way to ease back into it and how? Um, okay, so I think it's very unlikely that anyone's going to just jump straight back into normal practice. Now, I don't know um, what sort of guidelines are put in place by anywhere. Um, I'm based in the UK. We haven't decided specifically yet. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we kind of um, follow something similar to the All Japan Kendo Federation guidelines. But look, getting back into practice, I expect um, it's probably going to start with social distancing in, uh, in place, of course. Um, probably um, now, you know, once we're allowed to actually practice indoors together, possibly with reduced numbers, um, obviously, like I say, social distancing, probably just practicing alone as opposed, as opposed to practicing with others. That'll probably be the first steps. Um, things like Subudi and stuff like that. Um, we might have to take into consideration like protective masks or something. Um, we'll certainly have to have some sort of guidelines in place about making sure you don't have a temperature or you feel sick and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's going to be a an ease back into things that way. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be a chance of us just throwing on our borgo and getting back to how it was before um, without some sort of easing into it. And besides that, not even if, even if the virus disappeared tomorrow, um, it wouldn't be a good idea to just jump back into your borgo and practices before anyway. You're going to get hurt. You're going to be out of shape we need to ease back into it uh, and do it sensibly. Uh, next one. Hi Andy, a bit of a philosophical question. Uh, I once asked somebody about how long it took them to make Dan Rank, which is followed by a long lecture on how it's not about all the, uh, it's not all about competitiveness, uh, which wasn't even what I was after. I just know 
uh, I'm very goal. I'm a very goal oriented person, and I like to have something definite that I'm working towards. What do you feel is the right attitude to add, have towards competitiveness and desire to level up, so to speak? Cheers. Okay, so this is a bit of a controversial one for some reason. I've always been the sort of person that's tried, much like yourself, that's tried to achieve those goals um, as soon as I could. I wanted to get the grades as soon as I possibly could. It, there's nothing wrong with that because you still have to be at a certain level in order to pass the grades. It's not like you're rushing through the test. Um, and passing when you shouldn't have passed. If you're able to achieve that level, at, you know, whether it takes you one year or 10 years, you still have to achieve that level, right? So if you want to take the grades as early as you can, that shouldn't be a problem, okay? That shouldn't be a problem. Um, I got my first stand after 11 months of Kendall, um, and yeah, um, I've taken every grade as early as I possibly could. Um, if I hadn't felt ready to do that, I wouldn't have done it, probably. Um, though I may have tried to see if I could understand what things I was lacking, um, which is another purpose of grading, by the way. Uh, but I think it's perfectly appropriate to have that sort of uh, drive to uh, achieve your grades or to e enter the uh, tournaments um, and, and to achieve those milestones. Um, I, that's not a problem. I don't think it should be uh, considered, considered negative. I don't even think it's competitive. There's nothing to say. Just because I achieved um, I, I achieved my first stand after th 11 months of Kendall, I didn't do that so that I could prove to other people that I could do it faster than they could. I did that because that was the goal that I'd set myself. It's like if I wanted to lose weight in three months. There's, that doesn't make me particularly... Um, competitive. There's nothing wrong with that. That that gives me a goal to work towards in that time frame, and I don't see that that's that, that's a problem at all. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, <laughs> next one. Uh, I'm really enjoying and benefiting from your channel. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for all the hard work. Question: uh, When can we get another Kendo watch along? I enjoyed the 48th. All Japan Kendo Championships a couple of months ago. Cheers. Okay, so yeah, I've done a few of those now. Um, would you like to see more? You'd like to see more Kendo watch-alongs where we sit and watch a video together, watch a Shi'ai together. Um, I've done some live in the Kendo Show Early Access group and I've done some others where it's not live and I've just filmed it. Um, it takes time for me to do it. I'm very, very busy. Things are super busy for me here at Kendo Star. Uh, which is a good thing. Thank you, everybody, for your support. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but I will try and make more time to do those sort of things. Okay. Um, I do want to bring you all as much uh, valuable content as I possibly can. So um, I'll do my best to get something else like that out to you um, as soon as I can. Okay, last one. Uh, hi, Andy. I'm curious about the World Kendo Championships. What is the atmosphere like there? Uh, it's clearly very serious when inside the Shi'ai Joel, but how is it when you're not fighting? I imagine Western players get along with each other. Do the Asian teams also get along with everyone else? Is there a sense of elitism in the Japanese team? Or is everyone just too concentrated and keep to themselves? Lastly, are you planning on going to the next one as a player? Okay, so um, the atmosphere at the World Championships is... Um, is it, it's very different to anything else. It's it's amazing. Um, and it's it's fantastic from whatever capacity you visit it as. If you visit it as a spectator, um, <clears throat> it's it's awe inspiring. If you visit it as a player or as part of the part of a national team, um, and I'm sure as a referee as well, it, it's also awe inspiring. Um, it's it's the highest level of tournament in the world and it's where um the uh, essentially each country's elite teams gather in a single place <clears throat> uh, it's wonderful it's truly wonderful um there is of course seriousness and tension on the shi jo um and off the shi jo is you know certainly between uh, um between matches and on competition days uh <clears throat> everybody excuse me everyone is um everyone is still serious and well, for the most part um focused on their uh, the matches and on on what they're there to do um of course that's that that's the case that doesn't mean that people are cold or mean to each other there's not 
I haven't ever seen that sort of negative rivalry. Um, there's good rivalry, friendly rivalry, but I've never seen like where somebody's like being horrible to somebody or being, you know, that having that sort of negative energy towards somebody in that way. Um, there's no there's no elitism from the Japanese team in my experience at all. Um, all the Japanese team members that I know are, are really sound people, uh, really friendly, um, and they've always been uh, really open. Um, I've never never experienced them being elitist. Um, it's difficult if you don't speak Japanese to interact with them, of course. Um, but as I do, I've been able to. So I've I, I've been able to have that interaction with them. And yeah, I've, I've been very, you know, friendly with, with many of them over the years. Um, and I, I, there is, there is a great, um, in Europe, we have a very interesting, uh, situation because we, every year we have a European championships when there is, when there isn't a world championships. So every year our national teams get together, um, and have a big tournament and lots of the European because of, of how Europe is spaced geographically, lots of European tournaments are visited by people from many countries. Um, so lots of our national team players are on very good friendly terms with each other. Um, and they are, you know, they, they become part of your friend network. Um, and that extends itself at the World Championships as well. Uh, and I don't think that that's unique to Western players. Um, I have seen... Um, uh, you know, if you watch the matches between Japan and Korea, South Korea, their matches are very, very heated. Um, it looks like there's no love lost between the two. Um, but in private time uh, at the Sayonara party, stuff like that, those those people get on just fine. Um, you know, they get on really well, actually, uh, and, and are really friendly. Um, of course, there's language barriers, as you'd expect, but um, it, it, it's not all... <laughs> it's not it's not necessarily just like that so um i think it's a great atmosphere there um and it's a, it, it it's a positive atmosphere atmosphere for the most part um and as whether i'm um planning on going to the next one as a player um i'm i wouldn't say i'm planning on doing that no i've retired from the uh, national team scene for uh about five years or something now i didn't go to the last one uh i'm you know, there's a lot younger, <laughs> uh, faster players than I am. Uh, I am now, um, but you know, I never say never. But uh, I, 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 I expect to be at the next World Championships um, in some capacity, uh, whether that's involved with the national team, either as a player or as a as part of the coaching team or something else, um, or in a different capacity. Uh, we'll see, but I'll certainly be there. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. Don't forget. Uh, to support the channel by shopping at kendostar.com. Uh, and we've got a t-shirt shop as well. There's a t-shirt, Teespring store. People keep asking us for t-shirts. Uh, there's a link in the description down below. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.